Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your gaming monk for the evening. While I don't cover it often due to having insufficient equipment at this time, I'm no stranger when it comes to miniatures games. A good chunk of that is certainly rooted in the Warhammer fantasy and historical battle, as well as 40k, but it wasn't long before I ventured out of that bubble to find games that didn't suffer from Games Workshop being... <coughs> games Workshop. This led me to War Machine, with his more aggressive playstyle and steampunk mecha, or rather steamjacks, at play. Hell, I suspect the only reason Imperial Knights even exist in Warhammer 40k is because of the popularity of Steam Jacks. As much as I loved its setting, I never made the jump to the tabletop RPG version in Iron Kingdoms. Why? Well, it was using D20. Right in the middle of the D20 bubble. I'm not bashing the game, but at that time I had no interest in touching a 3.5 era D20 without heavily hacking it. Arguably, I still am no fan of it without heavily hacking it. Enter Iron Kingdom's Full Metal Fantasy, the most recent attempt at bringing the War Machine setting to tabletop, this time using something other than D20. And thus, I have a reason to delve into it. Does it hold up? Well, let's find out. At around 360 pages, Iron Kingdom's has as strong of a presentation as its miniature's counterpart, and a superior presentation to the D20 predecessor. The writing style doesn't have any real bleed issue, and the artwork is all high quality. Adapting a miniatures game means you won't be lacking in artistic resources, and there's plenty of lore and art the book draws from. While the book does have an index, my only real nitpick is the occasional reused art, much like Star Wars Saga Edition. All in all, it falls in line with Privateer's quality standard. Full Metal Fantasy is as far removed from the previous Iron Kingdom's D20 as one can get, and we'll start exploring that with our sample character Ilya, a sniper with a talent for the rune shot. The first step is race, which determines the starting and maximum stats, as well as any racial abilities. We'll be going with Iancian, using the hero tier stats and caps. This also grants an additional ability, but we'll get into that later. Step 2 is Archetype, which defines a character's general role as what they'll be mostly good at. Or rather, better at. We'll be going with Gifted, in order to use the magic required of this character. This grants us access to one of two magic traditions, Focuser and Will Weaver. We'll go with the latter, which grants an arcane stat of 3. In addition, we may gain one benefit from the Gifted list, which will be the Combat Caster in this case. Step 3 is Career. While this could be considered similar to the classes in other games, it's not exactly in that tradition, because you're already going to be assumed to be multiclassing. In any case, we'll choose two careers we qualify for and gain their starting packages. In this case, Gun Mage and Soldier. In both cases, we acquire the skills, abilities, Iron Kingdom's version of feats, spells, and equipment from both careers. This is also where the racial benefit comes in for an extra ability from one career. In this, we'll go with the Gun Mage's Key Knight ability. Step 4 is Stat Increases, where we have 3 points to spend on the primary and secondary stats. This makes his final stats to read as Physique 5, Speed 7, Strength 4, Agility 4, Prowess 4, Poise 5, Intellect 5, Arcane 4, and Perception 4. This also makes his willpower to be 10. Lastly, Equipment. We have a total of 125 GC from our two careers. We'll be spending that on 25 light rounds, an armored greatcoat, and a carbine. I do like the depth of choice presented in character creation, especially since the XP system isn't exactly a currency, but not quite a level system. The only nitpick I have is some strange cases of editing. Sometimes abilities show up in a career's advancement and in the starting package. I'd be alright with this if there was some kind of stacking benefit, but that's not exactly the case. Putting that aside, this is a game whose character creation hits the sweet spot I enjoy. Versatile, without being overwhelming. Iron Kingdoms uses a 2d6 system, much like another RPG rooted in a miniatures game that I hope to cover in the future, adding a stat plus skill and comparing it to a target number. As one might expect, criticals are activated when rolling box cars, and fumbles are activated when rolling snake eyes. Some criticals activate when rolling a success that merely has doubles. Some effects treat a roll as boosted, which add a third die. 
So you've got a lot of variation here. The game does have an extra effort mechanic in the form of feat points. While these can be given as a GM award, they can also be earned through defeating enemies and landing criticals. There's a wide variety of special actions that the feat points can be spent on, such as damage reduction, do over rolls, and moving while firing ranged weapons. Combat is mostly standard fare, though I'd imagine its use of inches instead of a grid might throw some people off. It's how the war game does, so naturally it would be done here. I understand why this was done, but no matter how much I understand it, it is going to take some getting used to for a lot of people. Damage has an interesting twist in its wound system, where each point that exceeds the target's armor, you roll a d6 and subtract that amount from the particular branch on the life spiral. For example, rolling a 6 while suffering 2 damage would check off 2 spots on the intellect spiral. If that track is full, you go to the next one in a clockwise manner. Putting aside the inches versus squares slash hex approach, combat is clearly designed to favor evasion over tanking, since damage can add up fairly quickly. While some might find contention in the two die rolls, I think it works here due to the fact that the game is being fairly generous with giving you means to mitigate damage, if played smartly. It doesn't hurt that through archetype picks you have more options to use the feat setup, but it wouldn't be Iron Kingdoms without the poster boy. Which brings us to our next part. Steamjacks, the large constructs that are Iron Kingdoms bread and butter, are a mainstay of armies in the war game and in the fiction. This ranges from laborjacks handling menial tasks to warjacks whose usage is self-explanatory. A steamjack is composed of three parts, which we'll run through a custom build for the purpose of this review. The first part is chassis, the skeleton makeup of the steamjack that makes up the majority of the jack's body. Chassis are either light or heavy and determines the size, fuel efficiency, stock cortex, and damage grid. In our case, we'll go with a Talon Light Warjack which grants us Physique 8, Strength 8, Speed 6, Agility 4, Prowess 5, Poise 3, as well as the Talon's Damage Grid. Second is the Cortex, the Brain of the Jack. This determines the intellect and perception it has, as well as any special modifiers. In our case, we'll be going with an Arcanum Grade Cortex, granting an intellect and perception of 3, a plus 2 melee and ranged attack bonus, as well as the Ambidextrous and 2 weapon fighting benefits. Lastly, weaponry, which is self-explanatory, I'd think. The majority of weapons are either handheld by the jack or are integrated with an arm. In our case, we'll go with a hand weapon and a light gun. Steam jacks don't necessarily have a life spiral. Instead, they have a damage grid whenever they take hits. Much like life spiral, when a steam jack takes damage, it's allocated to a column based on a d6 roll. This is checked from the top to bottom, with the lower ones resulting in crippled steam jack parts. This has a short-term hindrance to rolls, focus, or attacks depending on the part. After a battle where systems were crippled, you have to roll 2d6 to determine catastrophic damage, which is a factor in long-term damage on the steam jack until it can be repaired. While steam jacks do have a degree of autonomy, they're typically used in conjunction with the drives from a jack marshal or the focus of a warcaster, the latter being the focus of our next part. Instead of a set of spells per day, Magic in Iron Kingdoms operates on a spell point system rooted in the character's arcane stat. Before we can even get to the spells cast, we need to go into the two primary traditions, Will Weavers and Focusers. The first, Will Weavers, are closer to the traditional magic users in other fantasy games. They utilize a kind of reverse spell point in the form of fatigue. You normally gain fatigue based on the spell's cost, but you may increase this through boosting attack, damage, or range. If you accumulate fatigue higher than your arcane, you must immediately roll 2d6 and compare it to your total fatigue points. If the roll is higher than your fatigue, nothing happens. If it's lower, then the caster is exhausted and must immediately end its turn and cannot cast spells for one round. Focusers, on the other hand, spend a set number of focus points they gain from their arcane stat. This acts as a hard cap on your focus points and a reset at the start of each turn. In addition, Focusers are the only tradition that can allocate points to Steam Jacks, as well as Warcaster armor. Spell lists are significantly smaller in other games, separated by various careers or several within one career, like the Sorcerer. And each spell list isn't separated by level, but costs ranging from 1 to 4. My attitude with War Machine slash Hordes for the longest time was that it was a setting I'd love to run campaigns in, but the D20 rule set was a deal breaker due to my attitude about D&D's myriad of baked-in shortcomings when addressing non-traditional fantasy. 
With this version, it demonstrates that there's no real need to follow that trend, and it's better not to. In an odd way, this entry feels like a response to the restrictiveness of the D20 version, since a great deal of choice is at play in both characters and in play options. The fact that you're expected to have two careers almost feels like a response to 3.5's mess of multiclassing, and its skill-based approach is far more defined. The only real sticking point is that inches don't translate as well to combat maps. It's not a problem on its own, but bear in mind most RPGs are doing either Theater of the Mind or doing some form of 5-foot units. This is nitpicky, I know, but I'm fully aware that old habits can die that hard. All that said, I can safely give the game a stamp of Strongly Recommended. If you're a fan of Gonzo-style steampunk, this game deserves to be in your library. However, much like other miniatures coming to RPGs, the game is very married to its setting. Iron Kingdoms is going to suffer from the Metaplot story to a degree, so if you're looking for a more freeform take on steampunk fantasy, I'd advise sticking with the likes of Tephra instead.